Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. One. We're back. We're live with Russell Yu. Russell is, is our special co-host and guest person on Think Tech Asia, which is on Mondays every other week at 4 o'clock. Woo! So exciting to have him here. And he just came back from China. So this show is with Russell in the flesh. This is not electronics. It's the real Russell. And it's the real Beijing skyline, uh, Jay. Of course it is. And it's, it, it is Sunday morning. At, um, excuse me. It's Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. in Beijing. So <laughs> yes, glad to is. be back. So, you know, we got so many things going on in this world today. I don't know what to believe anymore. And I, you know, a lot of things you hear you can't believe. But uh, I understand that last week, uh, the United States, that is Mr. Trump, indicated he was going to try to prevent investment in technology by China in the United States. In other words, we don't want their money to invest in, in technology in this country. <clears throat> and, that, and, that, and that, he thinks, is sort of like uh, another tariff, and it will even the playing field, and it will stop all the unfair things that China has done in terms of uh, trade with the United States. <laughs> But uh, this doesn't sound like a great idea, and it, and it strikes at the heart of globalism itself. It strikes at the heart of the relationship that the U.S. and China have been developing for a long time. Um, what's your reaction, Russell? Well, I, I think that um, you know every country else has concerns about uh, technology, IP being um, transferred improperly to another country. But I think that we have. Or maybe we're not looking at the right solution. Um, for one, the world is globalized, so supply chains are globalized. So there's more interdependency uh, between companies, interests, uh, cross borders. Um, it's going to be very difficult to change that, number one. Number two, um, there are some mechanisms in place in the U.S. We have the uh, CFIUS, the committee uh, that looks at foreign investment in the U.S. that supposedly has this job of... Well, how do, you, how do you do that? I mean, the fact is, this country is a, an open book. We are really transparent. You can find, uh, and China is not necessarily like that, you can find uh, opportunities to invest. It doesn't matter who you are, really. Maybe in defense, I suppose, there's some limitation. There's some statutes. Um, but mostly, if you want to buy a company in the United States, come in with money and buy it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or if you want to buy stock in that company, come in with money and buy even a majority position mm -hmm. in that company. If you have enough money, you can buy the whole thing. Uh, may I say that again? If you have enough money, you can buy everything. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is in the United States, except for some very small mm -hmm. exceptions. In China, you know, there are regulations, there are rules, there are mm, joint venture requirements, there mm -hmm. are permitting and corporation arrangements that you have to get approved by, by, by the government and all that. So it's not as easy for an American investor in China. I think he, he sees that, and some people do see that, as uh, unfair. Well, I, I think, Jay, let's take a look at this, I think one thing that we're really overlooking is that um, when President Trump and uh, the American leaders look at China, the number second largest economy in the world, rapidly rising, a threat to us. I don't view it that way, being on the ground in China for many years. You've got to realize that um, it's a very different environment. Um, uh, the U.S. Uh, has a very well-established uh, uh, market system. It's transparent with a lot of laws. I think the standard of living is higher. Uh, there are more people in the middle class. In China, there is a developing middle class. But largely, a lot of the people, the majority of them, do not live in the large eastern seaboard cities that have developed into what China is today, the wealth, the affluence. So we're, we're looking at apples and oranges, you know. It's still come a long way. I think you have to look in a picture and say, well, in the last 40 years, China has developed rapidly. Uh, it went from no country to WTO. It went from no laws to laws. It went from no courts to courts. This is a lot of progress. And you've been there. And, and to I've been there for 15 first years, hand, yeah. first hand. And, and you've got to realize that you've got to give them more credit than what is due because we've had 200 years or more. The Constitution, the, 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 uh, we have more time we had been able to develop. And we still have our problems. Yes, we do. But again, oh, you have yes, to realize that uh, there are things that you've got to realize. You cannot compare China with the U.S. 
because it has a different path because it's 1.3 billion people. It's still largely a third world. But would you agree with the notion that it's easier to invest in, in technology right now today in the U.S., doesn't matter who you are, Chinese or otherwise, than it is for an American to invest in technology in China? Yes, and, and I think that's true. But you have to realize that one thing is, I go back and talk about why maybe things are like it is in the U.S. Um, maybe we can't blame Donald Trump for everything. It's just probably it's a progression for the last 50 years, 30, 40 years. Um, what has happened, my observation being in China, I also teach in a law school, uh, so I see a lot of bright kids. Um, we've seen a world where the children for 40 years ago have started learning English. That's a core requirement. They have to learn every year of their schooling all the way to college. And so they are, I think, they've built a lot of capacity. they built a lot of capacity for future generations to do things, okay? And I think the problem that I see uh, and I'm more critical of ourselves as Americans is that we haven't really invested in the American education system as I believe we should have compared to the Chinese world. The kids there, they know the Constitution very well. I teach a U.S. Constitution law class. They know the Constitution. Our kids, well, maybe not so. What you see on TV, you hear the Miranda rights, but that's about it. But So I, I find it a challenge. Um, so what we're not doing is a long-term approach, pointing it back into education. I think the, the problem that I have is that this administration recently said that we're going to cut the spending, the area which would go back into education. A major. We're going to put more money in defense spending, but not in education. You, and the China government has done the opposite. They, they put a lot of money into education, a global education. And I think that that's one of the things where, as Americans, we need to take a look at ourselves and say, we need to put it back in education. Mm -hmm. We need, because it's the the generations of the young people who uh, learn, acquire the knowledge, who develop the economy, who develop technology for us. Uh, this is what we're relying on. As we get older, it's a new generation, and, and you have to have... Uh, let, me, let me turn it around and say, is it bad for China to invest in technology and in those bright minds that are involved in technology? Is that bad? Does that do us damage in some way? You ask Google. You ask Silicon Valley, you ask all these companies. Uh, you remember when the, uh, President Trump had that ban on the Muslim travel? Uh, who were the first to object to it? All the Silicon companies, because we do not have the technological talent. We need the talent from these foreign countries, and we need it here. I, I understand your point, and, and I remember how shocked I was to find that um, Bill Gates, this is 10 years ago, was traveling around the country trying to gin up support in the colleges for tech education mm -hmm. because he wasn't getting enough, you know, trained technology students from the American college system that could populate Microsoft. <coughs> and I, this is very troubling. Okay. And it hasn't, it hasn't improved as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, um, it, it, Microsoft was hiring globally, and all of them, as you point out, are hiring globally. But what has that got to do with the investment part? Uh, that's where I get lost on, on Trump's initiative here. He wants to stop investment by China. I guess that includes everybody in China, every man, woman, child, and, and, and well, everybody in China from investing in American technology? What, what is that well, about? I, I think we have to look at what he's, what and he's how doing. how you do that? I think we have to look in a broader picture what he's doing because when he says we're going to stop Chinese investments coming to the U.S. technology, well, you have many companies who are Chinese that will do maybe joint research centers with American companies. And we learn from them just as much as they learn from us. And again, with that, remember, it, it builds a safer world because then, and to some extent, we and them, you know, I won't say them, but other people around the world, we, we, I certainly we share agree. the benefits. I certainly agree, but how does investment by China into the United States, into American tech companies, hurt us? What is Trump concerned about? What is the problem here that he's trying to solve by stopping it? Uh, isn't it a good thing to have foreign investment, offshore investment coming into your jurisdiction? Isn't that what everybody likes? They want that? They go out worldwide and, and scour every, every place on earth to find foreign investment? Now he says he don't, I don't understand. Well, you know, Jay, what I'm, what I'm more troubled about, and uh, to be honest with you, it's not only just the proposed ban on, on foreign investment from China, 
but it means this. Um, uh, the last show we talked about, there's some very, very, very concerned signals that we, we see. We have the head of the FBI saying that the Chinese people are a threat to our society. And so the, the, the one of the other proposal is to, to now to restrict the Chinese students from coming to the U.S. to our colleges. And, um, you know, there are a lot of Chinese students who come to the U.S. to do their Ph.D. work or their master's work. And so uh, that's part of it, because a lot of them are in the area of technology, uh, doing master's work. And so there's a Chinophobia. There's a Chinophobia that everything, not only just technology, but education. We're going to stop the flow. It's, it's scary. Now, he, he's also, does he also want to stop the flow of talent from China into the United States? Yes, that's what they're Is looking at. part of the part, same initiative? That's part of the same initiative to, to, to restrict the Chinese students from coming Just to the U.S. isolate, keep them away, keep them out. Are we going back to like... Out of our economy, out of our schools, all that. It's, it's almost like the uh, 1950s the, the scare, you know, the Red Scare. We're going to keep everybody out, you know? I don't know what this is going to accomplish, you know, because it's a global world. No matter what happens, Jay, uh, there's the Internet. How's he going to do it, though? Well, I mean, how do you keep investment out? You make a statute. I suppose there must be statutes that say we don't want foreign countries, especially countries that might be adversary to our interests, investing in our, our defense uh, company, our defense industry, our defense sector. There must be statutes that, that prohibit that. But or for that matter, yeah. selling goods, selling weapons and the like. There must be statutes that govern that. But, but it's very hard to enforce that when you're talking about foreign investment uh, in, a, in a, a huge American industry. Well, you know, that's why you do have a certain mechanisms in place. You have the Committee for uh, the Foreign Investment in the U.S. They're composed of 14 agencies, including the military, high military, the tax, and so forth, Congress. And they will look at investments coming to the U.S., and they can void it. They can say, we don't recommend this, and the president has the power to say no. Uh, president Obama has done that with uh, twice, I believe. With the, and so, again, you have this in place. So, again, um, this means that now it comes maybe under the office of the president. I know who it's going to come under, but it sounds like that initiative is going to give him more power to do things. It's like we're going to put the wall up. You know, uh, we're going to send the National Guard in. We're going to we're inching towards that in, in our society that uh, reaches the bounds of the U.S. Constitution. You know, what can you do? You know, the, the, the Constitution gives the president so many powers. He is a limited power. You know, federal judges are more powerful than the president because they have life tenure, <laughs> again. So, you know, again. But so we are very challenging times, but this whole thing to keep it all out um, doesn't make sense economically. It doesn't make sense because today we are, a, uh, to some extent, with the Internet. We cross borders all the time, uh, and um, it, it wouldn't make sense. Well, okay, we're going to take a short break, Russell. That's Russell Yu. He's a Hawaii lawyer practicing and teaching in uh, Beijing for 15 years now. And he comes with a certain amount of, you know, firsthand experience and exposure to the way things are in China and how China engages with the United States. And he and I both are concerned with the, with the position this administration is taking about um, future economic relations with, with China. We'll be right back, and we'll discuss then uh, what happens if Trump succeeds. Where do we go from there? We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by Think Tech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia, Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East, South to Australia and New Zealand. We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1, called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show, where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. OK, 
Okay, we're back with Russell Yu. He's a lawyer, a Hawaii lawyer, um, practicing and teaching in Beijing for 15 years. And he, uh, he talks to us by, by remote, by Zoom or Skype, time to time. And he also comes to the studio when he's in town. Luckily, we have him here now. So, <clears throat> Russell, <clears throat> you know, we have the administration trying to isolate itself from Chinese investment and, for that matter, Chinese talent that might come here, or people who would come to our schools and become talented here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think you and I both feel the same way. That's not a good idea. But, you know, through, through technique of one kind or another, uh, and with Congress's help, he may be able to achieve an isolation from China that way. I mean, the tariffs begin, and then there's the tariff war that's been happening, and now, what do you want to call it, the tech investment war that he set up here a few, a few days ago that was covered in the Wall Street Journal. Um, let's assume he succeeds. Let's assume he stops uh, tech investment coming from China into the U.S. Mm -hmm. Let's assume he stops people who are trained and interested in participating in tech entrepreneurial activities in the U.S., he, he stops them from coming to China. So I need to investigate with you. What happens? What happens to the U.S.? What happens to our tech industry, our schools that are relevant to this? They have enough trouble, you know, filling the classes anyway. Um, and what happens uh, to our economy in general? Mm -hmm. And then I want to ask you, what happens to China? And then I want to ask you, <clears throat> How does our relationship with China change? It's already changing, I'm, I must say, not for the, not for the better. Um, but those are the questions we need to talk about. So, so first, how would this affect the United States? Well, I, I think for one is, is that I think we should look at it as it's a positive opportunity for us to do things that we have not been doing. We need to build capacity. It's like the saying goes, we just need to build a better mousetrap. We're not building a better mousetrap if we are not training the, the talent in the U.S. We're not putting back money, investing it back into our own schools to develop capacity. China has been doing that for the last 30, 40 years, developing capacity, Jay. So what and happens to us if we shut them out? Well, if you shut them off, for one thing, um, we will have probably less foreign talent. It's probably not going to just be the Chinese. It's going to be starting with every other foreign companies, country, excuse me, who we think is a risk. We're going to start shutting all that up. We don't have enough talent in, in this science, technology, and math. Okay? So what happens? You have a degradation of the, of the tech industry the tech for the industry lack of that here, talent? Is that what? Talent. Uh, second, second of all is that... Uh, scholars say, uh, especially uh, many of them with the U.S. law firm, say that China, it doesn't matter because they have already built the capacity in a few years that they will exceed the number of people, talent, that will, will probably bypass us in a lot of intellectual property errors. They've already had the talent, okay? Uh, they, they don't really need us for this. Do they, they? they don't need us. I mean, maybe they did once upon a time, maybe until recently, but right now it seems to me they have a lot of talent and a lot, a lot of opportunities opportunities for that talent, and they can design good software, creative software, and manufacture great products. What do they need us for? It sounds like if you had to balance who wins and who loses, it's lose-lose for the U.S. I, I think you're right, Jay, because we're looking at the wrong things. We're not looking where it counts. It's building capacity, which they've done that. They'll exceed us. They've surpassed Japan last year to be the largest, second largest economy with the number of patents being filed. So they, they're on their way. They're on their way to, to many things, okay? Um, they're in a society where they've leapfrogged us in many ways in technology, and we, we're still sitting on old platforms. And we refuse to change. You know, we talked about WeChat the last time in some of our shows. You have people who are 60, 70 years old using smartphones. They're into technology. They, they pay through the smartphones. They cut costs. A lot of the modern brick, you know, is, 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 is gone. It's, it's a new world. Okay, so China's ahead of us in many ways in terms of developing and uh, educating its, uh, its graduates to participate uh, in the development of a tech industry. So what happens? But they still want to come here. 
and they still want to invest here. We're still a kind of tech mecca, aren't we? Um, what happens if, if, if we stop all of that? Uh, how profoundly will we be injuring ourselves, shooting ourselves in the foot? And what will happen to all those tech graduates that we are getting from China right now? I mean, we all know them. I mean, they're here at the university, great numbers, and they're great academicians. They're great thinkers. They get great discipline, uh, and they're interested in learning and um, you know doing all the things that maybe maybe are hard to find in this country. So mm -hmm. my my question is, um, how is that going to affect us? It sounds sudden, it sounds profound, but what happens? Well, I think I think all of us, we'll, 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 we're going to do it. What we do is shut the border up. It's we're just shutting the border up, you know. And you know, one thing that always uh, confuses me is the fact that you have a lot of great talent come here, that come to our schools, and then we tell them, one year, two years at most, you got to leave. We should be taking that talent. If you're talking about the new technology, you should be taking these people in. Let them become Americans. But no, there's this prevailing thought in this administration is that everybody who is Chinese is a spy. I mean, literally, that's what came on the press about three weeks ago. The head of the FBI says that we take a threat to our American society, the Chinese society. Again, this is, it smacks me McCarthyism. Here we're going again. Um, we're going to the back of the 1950s. We're going to shut our borders, okay? But, but one observation I have, Jay, is that living in China, I see it very differently because they are moving into a very different e economic stage. They are building capacity, not only capacity, but now they're a society where they, they're building their consumer spending. They have enough consumer spending, so that will tie their society over. They have consumer spending, okay, which is a very important component. If, if, if we cut the borders, the Chinese will say, okay, we won't buy Americans, we'll buy Chinese only. Well, that's what I'm no getting Apple at. phones. That's what I'm getting at. That's so. Number one is we lose the ability, with, with the lack of that talent, to do the kinds of things we've been doing. Um, this is very important. And with the lack of uh, the the um, investment they might make, they have been making, and uh, which we would stop them from making. Um, we lose the ability to do that entrepreneurial thing. Everybody knows that tech requires capital, and you can't you can't move fast enough to keep up with the tech market if you don't have lots of capital. That's the whole. Thing. Thing in Silicon Valley, the whole thing with tech entrepreneurship. Um, and, and so you, we, you we lose the capacity it. here, okay, but they don't lose anything. Well, you the, just you just read a great point. I had to jump in uh, uh, today. One important thing is capital. Most of the world's money now that is being used in technology, research, technology things, it's not coming to the U.S. It's a lot of it's going to China, fine tech money. All its investment money is going to China, not the U.S. Where is it coming uh, from? And it's coming all over the world. Is uh, it coming from the U.S.? It's coming from the U.S. as well. Uh, and so, again, um, you can't change some of that market economy forces. Are you going to tell the American companies now you're restricted from investing in China? You're, 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 so he's impossible. also going to try to stop us, stop our investors from investing in China. Because I think the whole point is that the, the recent... Uh, uh, thing where Huawei wanted to sell their phones in the U.S. It's just sell their phones, okay? They had a deal with, I think it was AT&T, AT &T. and so their administration and Congress put the pressure, Republican uh, administration, put the pressure on the major carrier, you're not going to do business with them, da da da. There was no evidence brought out that there was actual spying caught, or the phones had some secret backdoor thing that would spy on Americans. Um, nothing like that. In fact, Huawei, because it has been having a hard time to enter this market, has been actually working with a lot of the rural carriers who cannot really uh, afford to work with some of these other major phone mm -hmm. companies. And so, uh, and th but there was no evidence of, 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 of espionage. But here we go again. So now we're cutting and controlling the market. It okay. becomes more right. than just technology. Okay, but that's not, that's not strictly speaking, American investment in, chi in Chinese companies. It's making a deal with a Chinese company. Anything Chinese. So, it's, so, so, the, so that's another, that's a whole new element. So we have 
um, correct me if I'm wrong, but one is a slowdown of our tech industry for the lack of talent and investment, okay? Two, no slowdown of the Chinese uh, tech industry because they're already operating on, and they have and they have a global market, they don't even, you know. And then, of course, uh, I guess Trump wants to stop us from buying Chinese goods, and he, and he wants to, uh, yeah, like the WeChat and the phones and whatnot. He wants to stop us from trading with them on technology. Uh, what, is, what is really, truly remarkable is that they don't really need us. I think we're a big market, no, no question about that. But the world's a big market, and they can develop other parts of the world market to replace us. I guess, you know, where, where, I, where I'm kind of heading on this is that right now, like it or not, fair or unfair, we have a long-term tech relationship with China. People, money, markets. It's all pretty well developed. Maybe they, they take advantage of us. I, mean, I wouldn't argue that they're always as good to us as we are to them. But sometimes we're not so good to them either. Um, and if you, if you get off that and you put a wall down between them and you don't try to work it out, this is the operative term, you don't try to work it out, then you're having a profound effect on, on I guess, on both countries, but mostly on the U.S., no? Well, I think this is a very profound. What, what, what really is more concerning is that, where is this heading to, Jay? This may be one step oh. towards pure isolationism, but there's a Chinophobia. But what, what concerns me is that John Bolton, I believe, is the, the uh, secretary. I, I, of, I, I, I can't hear you. Or so. John Bolton, who's the secretary of uh, defense, saying that we're ready to go to war with China. That's very irresponsible, Jay. Complete nuts. Well, uh, if you, know, you start accumulating war, all these points, the, the remarks Bolton has made, the remarks Trump has made, and the daily changes in, in their policy, and the fact they don't, have, they don't have a real policy and they don't have a real State Department either, um, you know, you have, you have a, a diminution, a, de a degradation, to use that term, of the diplomatic relations between the, country. so, the countries. So you have a degradation of the, of the economy, economic connections and the diplomatic relations. You have this wall being built on both levels, it can't go to a good place. It won't, it isn't going to a good place. Uh, it's going to go to a place of contention, and contention leads to war. War. And that's... And and we're not really prepared for that. I don't think we're really prepared for that. I mean, I don't think any American is prepared for that. And, but we are starting to head for that because the things that are being said from watching from in China to U.S., it's like this, is when you tell somebody you are ready to go to war, uh, the Asian culture mind, you, you know, you give no room for them to negotiate. That's telling you there is nothing to negotiate. And at that point, you lose face. Well, that, and, and that really is where we need to go in this conversation. So I, I don't think the United States, you know more, I don't think the United States has done enough negotiation. I don't think we've been Akamai about uh, you know, trade discussions, about entering into um, bilateral, multilateral trade agreements and sticking with it, not changing your mind every day. Um, so I think, I think the problem here is that we haven't really um, we haven't really tried. We haven't really tried to work these things out, these things that Trump is concerned about, with just talking and trying, you know, so stop with the joint venture requirements. So, so ease up on the woofy opportunities. Don't tell us we have to go through all this red tape to start a company. Uh, if that bothers Trump, he, he should have some people discussing it with him. But he's dismembering the um, State Department. That, that's not happening. Instead, we get, the, we get the, this communication across the nether where everybody argues with each other and nobody tries to work it out. This is pretty serious. Um, so what, what would you do to save the situation, Russell? You know, I, that's a really good question, Jay. I, 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 I think that, again, um, I think that you, you do put enough pressure on China. I think Xi Jinping came out with a speech that was really important. It was very interesting because I was there in China when Xi Jinping gave the speech that we're going to open up uh, on certain markets, we're going to change the ownership requirements on the auto industry, um, and people in the U.S. coming back here saying, well, that's only lip service, again. But you got to remember, in their culture, when a leader says that, that is, that is progress, because he cannot go back on his word. That's a face issue. You cannot go back and word. But then when he says that, and then you get the U.S. Um, saying later on, we're ready to go to war, that's not good enough, uh, that's BS. 
Then you put the leader into a different position where he loses his face. He loses face. He has to make up for that. And then he's going to say, "See, I'm trying to give you something to move this, but you're not taking it. You want it all now." And so, in the, in the Chinese world, they're going to go back and say, "Remember when the British took it all from us? Remember when the foreign powers came to our country and quartered it? And they, we used to have Beijing, the Japanese, the German, French. Everybody wanted to take from us." See, this is where we headed back. So I cannot now give you anything. You put me in a situation where there's nothing well, to negotiate. And if you want to do tariffs, we'll do tariffs. We'll and, do tariffs. And we'll do them in a more clever, more nuanced way, and you'll suffer more than we will. And you know, you got to remember about history. When China, prior to opening up, a lot of hardship, people struggled, but they survived. They find ways to survive. And living in their world, I can see how they survive, and I don't think that what America does will will make them any worse off. They will survive, and they will find ways.、Um, what disturbs me is more like this: by the time when you hear the word that U.S. says we're ready to, for war, you hear that back in China. Now it's not government to government dialogue. Now it's like you people. people. You people, we don't、We're、like threatening you. Us with threatening us. So,、uh, one of my secretaries said, I, "I had to change some renminbi into dollars," and she, and she said, "No problem." And she said, "But wait a minute, I'm not sure if anybody wants to help you because the Chinese citizen can change more dollars from my renminbi. Help me out, because the bank thinks maybe you're the enemy." Because now we hear all this talk about going to war, you've just made it into something that makes it very difficult on a slippery slope for by, by people, person by person, person to person. That's what what what、uh, what the signals that we're seeing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Russell. This is really interesting and a little scary, as so many other things are these days. Thanks for coming down. I hope I hope we can catch you again before you head head off back to Beijing, eh? We'll try that, Jay. Okay, Shay Shay, Sai Jin, Sai Jin. See you soon, you bugger. Aloha, Jay.